We all have come armed with what we believe is a word from God. And when you come to a meeting, especially a meeting like this, it amazes you when it's all said and done. We don't, we don't collaborate and share notes. We just all listen to the same God, and he begins to lead us and direct us, and we stand in awe of, of what he orchestrates. Joshua chapter 22, beginning with verse 1. Then Joshua called the Reubenites and the Gadites and the half-tribe of Manasseh and said unto them, You have kept all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you and have obeyed my voice in all that I commanded you. You have not left your brethren these many days unto this day, but have kept the charge of the commandment of the Lord your God. And now the Lord your God hath given rest unto your brethren. As he promised them, therefore now return ye and get ye unto your tents and unto the land of your possession, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, and I want you to notice this, gave you on the other side, Jordan. But take diligent heed to do the commandment and the law, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, charged you to love the Lord your God and to walk in all his ways to keep his commandments and to cleave unto him and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. So Joshua blessed them and sent them away and they went unto their tents. And I'm going to take a, just a moment here tonight and preach to you what I believe the Lord has placed in my spirit to declare tonight. I'm speaking on this subject, blessed in the borderland blessed in the borderlands. Could we lift up our voice one more time and I do covet your prayers tonight in the name of Jesus. God, I thank you for your holy word, for your Holy Spirit. Move upon this meeting continually as you have already begun to do and I pray for your anointing to rest upon me as I endeavor to preach your word. I ask that you would minister to every soul that is here, every soul that is viewing. I pray, Lord, that you would have your way. Speak clearly. Let the Word of God come forth with accuracy, with boldness, with love, with direction, we pray. In the precious name of Jesus Christ. And everybody said, in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. And amen. Can we clap our hands one more time as we're seated in the name of the Lord? I'm going to be speaking to you tonight about two and a half tribes of Israel. One tribe is the tribe of Reuben. <clears throat> One tribe is the tribe of Gad. And then there is a half tribe of Manasseh. And these entities, these peoples, are the, the subject of what we're dealing with tonight in this message and we see in our passage that we have chosen as a text that Joshua is speaking to these two and a half tribes and he is commending them because he says you have kept the commandment of the Lord and you have obeyed what Moses the prophet gave to you to obey and you have obeyed everything that I have given to you. And he said, and all of this is to your benefit. And, and he said, because of that, you are, you are actually going to receive the possession of inheritance from God that you have asked about. And that possession was land on the other side, Jordan. But he gave them this commission, this admonishment. He said, you must continue to keep the commandments of the Lord. He said, you must continue to serve the Lord with all of your heart and with all of your soul. He said, do diligently take heed to the commandment and the law of God. To understand the beauty of this passage and to understand the significance of it, we, we have to revisit that original exchange between Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh that they had with Moses. 
That's found in Numbers chapter 32. As lands and inheritances were beginning to be distributed and divvied up, if you please, Reuben and Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh came to Moses with a very unusual request. Everybody was excited because they were moving across the Jordan and into the land of promise. Everybody was thrilled the long-awaited moment that had been put on delay for 40 years because of the hardness of the hearts of those who originally rejected it. A whole generation had passed, and now, now the time has come, and, and, and as they look to the inevitable, and Moses, having lived through one traumatic disappointment and that, that actually cost him something very dear to him, and, and, and preparing the people of God to know that, hey, the day is coming that you are going to enter into the land of promise. He accepts this appointment with the tribe of Reuben, the tribe of Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, and to his dismay, they ask him for land on the other side of Jordan, not the side that everybody's excited about venturing into, but the side they're dwelling in. And when Moses heard it, it took him back. It took him aback, and it took him back to kind of a dark place in his own personal history. He recalled that tension that was experienced at Kadesh Barnea. He remembered what it was like to be so close to entering into the land of promise only to have that opportunity thwarted by those who did not believe. And, and when he hears Reuben and Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh saying, we want to stay on this side of the Jordan, he said, wait a minute, what are you talking about? Why would you, why would you ever stay on this side of Jordan? Why do you want land on the wrong side of the Jordan? God has given us land and God has established boundaries around that land. God has established parameters and borders, and, and we're going to cross over. And I'm going to just tell you, Moses was angry at this request. His, his, his temperature was rising. His blood pressure seems to be rising. He gets a little, he gets a little flushed. He gets a little indignant, and he said, I, I, no, I've been through this before. I know where this is coming from, and I've seen people do this kind of thing before. You're trying, to, you're trying to depart from the promise of God. You're trying to leave when the going gets tough. You're trying to be noncommittal. You don't want to fight battles with us because you know there are battles awaiting us on the other side of the Jordan. And Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh, I, just as angry as Moses was, and it's important to take note of that, just as angry as he was, Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh had an interesting reaction. Reuben and Gad were the tribes talking with Moses, and Reuben and Gad tribes had an interesting reaction. Their reaction was understanding. They were calm. They were collected. Their demeanor was subdued, and they said, we understand what you're saying, but we want you to hear us out. The only reason we want to be on the other side of Jordan is for our cattle. There is a lot of land over there, and we have a lot of cattle, and we need the land for the cattle. There is a lot of land, and there is a lot of grain in that ground. We want to go over there and sow seed, and we want to reap harvest, and we want to feed our cattle. And Moses stands and listens to their reasoning. I can see him tapping his foot, looking through narrowed eyes, Wondering if he's being duped or not. He said, all right, I'm going to try your spirit. I'm going to see if this is really all about harvest or not. I want you to come across the Jordan anyway, and I want you to fight with us. I want you to take up arms, and I want you to put your shoulder to the battle, and I want you to help us subdue our enemies. I want you to help us fight these giants that await us in the land that God has promised us. And we'll see if you're really serious or not. Because if you'll do that, 
then you can have the land on the other side of the Jordan. It was a test of their character. And, and it was a test of their spirit. Were they just talking to get what they wanted and saying what they knew Moses wanted to hear? Or were they serious about this matter of harvest? Well, they did fight. They did go across the Jordan. They did take up arms. Reuben and Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh all journeyed with Israel across the Jordan and they fought the fight of faith. They fought the battles against the enemies of God's people. They waged war. They were in the trenches. They were in the foxholes. They were fighting with their brothers in this battle against those who had occupied the land of promise. And God gave them the victory. Which brings us to Joshua chapter 22. Joshua chapter 22 opens with Joshua. Now Moses is gone and time has passed. And now the real distribution of property has come. And Joshua looks at Reuben and Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh and he says... All right, guys, you did it. You did what you said you would do. And Moses told you that if you would do what you said you would do, fight the good fight, that you would have land on the other side of the Jordan. And so I want you to know you passed the test. You did what you said you would do. And you are going to now receive the land that you have asked for with this admonishment. Keep fighting. Obey God. Just as you obeyed Moses, keep obeying the word of God. Never forsake the commandment of God. Never forget who you are. Serve the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul. Obey the commandment of God. Obey the law of God. And, and with that, he released them to go to the other side of the Jordan. This was a scary thing, though, to many of the Israelites because while they passed the test, the other side of the Jordan was, there was some distance between them and the rest of Israel now. They, 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 were, they were now in what, what could be known as the borderlands. They, they were really close to the Moabites. They were really close to the Ammonites. They were really close to the Edomites. Their land bumped right up against these various nations, and these were nations who shared DNA with them. There were some similarities that the Moabites had with the Israelites because they really came from the same family tree. But they were not in Isaac as the seed of Isaac. And they were not in the promised lineage. And they were not the Israelites. And so as, as Reubenites and the Gadites and the half-tribe of Manasseh go across the Jordan and they enter into the borderlands. And there's lots of land and there's lots of fields to be harvested. But they look over and they're, they're looking right square in the eyes of the Moabite nations and Ammonite nation and Edomite nation. And they started feeling like, you know what? We're kind of far from what we know and are familiar with. And so they decided they were going to build an altar. And they built an altar at the passage of the Jordan. And, and they built this altar, the Bible says, to be a replica of the altar that was in Israel. And this is what they said. This was their reasoning. They said, because we don't want our children to grow up in these borderlands and forget who they are. We don't want them to see more of the Moabites than they do of the Israelites and forget who they are. We don't want them to get so close to the Ammonites that they forget about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So they built an altar and, and they put it right next to the passage of, from, from, that, that would cross over the Jordan, and when they built this, word spread through Israel that the Reubenites and the Gadites and the half-tribe of Manasseh, Manasseh, they have gone over into those borderlands, and they've built an altar. And we know what that means. And it angered, the Bible says, the whole congregation of Israel. 
The Bible says the whole congregation of Israel was so angry at this that they came together and they were ready to go to war against the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. It, there was indignation. There was anger and hostility. They were ready to fight because they did what they knew we would do. They would do. We knew they'd go over there and forget all about the God of Israel. We know they're going to bring reproach on us, and they think it's just affecting them, but it's not just affecting them. It's going to affect all of Israel. And, they, and, and, and they, they acted like one thing when they were over on this side of the Jordan. But they get over on the other side of Jordan and they're acting like somebody else. We know what they're going to do with that altar. They're going to sacrifice on that altar. It's going to be an abomination unto God. And the judgment of God is going to come upon all of Israel. And the Bible says that they appointed princes from each tribe. The chief tribes. And princes from each tribe went across the Jordan and and they confronted the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. And they said, have you forgotten about Korah? How that he invited the judgment of God upon him. Have you forgotten about Achan? How that he was so wowed and, and enamored with a Babylonish garment. And he took it unto himself. And that reproach caused all of Israel to come under the judgment of God. Have you forgotten about the 40 years in the wilderness. Do you not know what sin will do? Do you not know that when you use this altar to sacrifice unto God that it's an abomination unto the Lord? They were angry and they were, they were demanding an answer. And I think it's interesting again that the Reubenites and the Gadites and the half-tribe of Manasseh responded with, with some, some composure. You know, you can respond with composure when your spirit is pure. You know, you're not, you're not as, you're not as, you're not as angered by that kind of hostility when you are right with God and you know that if God be for me, who can be against me? You know, we've got to understand that we cannot let our flesh win the day. We have to walk in the spirit and not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to mention, this is how you can test your flesh. To, to understand how to test whether we're in the flesh or in the spirit, we've got to go back to the cross. When you go back to the cross, that horrible display of torture and, and grotesque beating and wounding of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. And, and all of it was gruesome and all of it was terrifying. But the guy that makes me the angriest, if you please, is the guy with the spear. Because the guy with the spear, just he just out of nowhere, he just lunges and puts the spear into the side of Christ. The innocent man, and, 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 and if he hadn't been through enough already, a crown of thorns and stripes on his back and nails in his hands and nails in his feet, and he's been through all of this torment, and now you're just going to put a spear in his side. But when he did it, Jesus never winced. Jesus didn't brace himself. Jesus didn't lash out. Jesus didn't curse. Jesus didn't get defensive. And you want to know why? Because Jesus was crucified. His flesh was crucified. And if you want to test whether you're walking in the flesh or in the spirit, it's, it's found in how you react to those who take shots at you. When they take shots at you and you fire back, your flesh is alive. When they take shots at you and you lash out, your flesh is alive. When they take shots at you and you curse them, your flesh is alive. But when you will just let the blood and the water flow, then your flesh is crucified with Christ. And now you live, not you, but Christ who lives within you. Hallelujah. But Jesus had already given up the ghost. And one of the reasons you have trouble with your, your ability to, to compose your self-response is you haven't given up enough ghosts. 
You've got some ghosts hanging around. You've got some past things that you're still dealing with. And you've got to give up the ghost so the blood and the water can flow. See, to be in the work of God today, you don't need just thick skin. You need dead flesh. Because guess what? The fiery darts are coming. Guess what? Accusations are coming. Guess what? Insults are coming. Guess what? People are going to take shots at you, and you've got to be willing to say, blood and water, blood and water, blood and water, healing, forgiveness, Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost. We've got a work of God to do. We've got a word to declare. We don't have time to lash out at people who know not what they do. And Reuben and Gad and, and the half-tribe of Manasseh had every right to, to, to get themselves all worked up. Who do you think you are come traipsing across the Jordan with accusations in your mouth? What do you mean the whole congregation of Israel is angry at us? Who do they think they are? We've got a call from God. God told us to come over here. We did what we were asked to do. They didn't do any of that. This is what they did. They said, okay, examine us. Examine us. You've got a problem with the altar. We get that. You've got a problem with the altar. Let's talk about this altar. We're not going to sacrifice on it. It's not a sacrificial altar. And who knows if it was even the right thing to do. Who knows if it was even a good idea. But, but, but we, we, the reason we built it is because we want our kids to know who they are and who we are. And it scares us sometimes where we're located because we don't want our kids growing up one day and thinking they're Moabites instead of Israelites. We don't want our kids growing up thinking that they're Ammonites and not Israelites. We, we, we want them to understand who God called us to be. We want them to know who our fathers were. We want them to know the blessing of Abraham. We want them to understand the promises of God. And when they come back into Israel and cross that Jordan, I, I want them to be able to speak the language and know the customs and understand the purpose. And I want them to be very familiar with this altar. And let me just tell you something. It's a replica. It does not replace the real altar. You can't build a replica to replace the real sacrifice. You can't have the trappings and the tapestry and all the appearance of it. It's got to be the real thing. Something that the fire can fall on. Something where the flesh dies. Something where you can commune with God. You, 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 can, you can praise your heritage all you want, but if you're not letting the fire fall like they let the fire fall. Reuben and Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh said, listen, you, you, you can examine us. We just, we're trying to, this is what we're trying to accomplish. And the Bible says that the thing pleased the princes of Israel. They narrowed their eyes started tapping their foot. All right, they said. All right. We're pleased. And they said, can we name the altar? And you know, they gave it a really well thought out name. They called it Ed. It is literally an altar named Ed. And it means this. The Lord our God is one. Listen, borders are important, and they're important to God. And God established borders, and God established parameters, and God established boundary lines, and he put his people in those boundary lines, and he put them in those borders, and he did it for a reason. He did it because Israel is a special people, not because they in themselves are special, but because they had a father named Abraham who believed in God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. And he heard the voice of God say, leave thy father's house and leave thy father's kindred and go into a land that I will show you. And he did that and God, God just got carried away blessing him. He said, blessing, I will bless you and multiply 
multiplying, I will multiply you. And I'll bless those that bless you and I'll curse those who curse you. I will bless you, bless you, bless you. Every place you place your foot, I'm going to give it to you. God is no respecter of persons, but he was looking for a person that he could raise up among the people and say, none of you know who I am, but I created you. None of you know my voice, but I spoke this whole world into existence. None of you even understand me, but this man hears me, and this man is obeying me, and I'm going to raise him up for all of you to see what it looks like to be blessed by God. Abraham, I'm going to give you seed. I'm going to give you a son. And he's going to have a son. And he's going to have sons. And it's going to multiply and multiply. And it's going to multiply. And, and, and so Israel, yeah, Israel is set apart. And the borders are important. And the reason the borders are so important is because the, the, the borders create a, a boundary and a parameter wherewith God can protect this peculiar treasure and he can establish within these borders the beauty of principle and the word of God and the word of life and blessing. And within those borders, he can establish truth in their hearts. And within those borders, he can develop them as a light that always shines. And he can, he can commune with them and he can atone their sins and he can preserve them so they can bring forth the Messiah who will take away the sins of the world. The borders were there to protect God's people. The borders were there to protect them from invaders and to create a, a wall, if you please, that would allow God to, to preserve them and not let them be influenced by all the false teaching that surrounded them and the barbarism that surrounded them. Pastor Myers mentioned it earlier today in that magnificent message that he preached where that in the ancient days, those were terrible times. Abraham, Abraham had to, when he traveled, it was different than when you traveled here. Just to go into a city, he had to tell Sarai, listen, we got to act like you're my sister. It's just, it's just the way it is in today's world. It's a terrible world we're living in. It's barbaric, and they literally will kill me and kidnap you. So we've got to act like you're my sister, and that was the world he lived in. In the days of Noah, the Bible says that the thoughts of every man was only evil continually only evil they didn't have a thought that wasn't evil they didn't nothing good or pure flash through their mind it was only evil and it was continual in the days of Noah and God sets his people apart and said I'm going to put borders and boundaries around you because I've got to preserve you and and I can't let anything in here to mess this up and you've got to understand your God is one Unlike the other gods of this world, they think that there are many gods, but, but you know that you know that you know that you know that the Lord our God is one Lord. And your God is invisible. He's not like their, their little statues and wooden items and idol, idols of, of gold and silver and brass and bronze. No, your God is invisible and, and, and he, he rides upon the wings of the wind and maketh the clouds his chariots and sitteth upon the circle of the earth and stretches the north over the empty place. And you walk by faith. You're a different kind of people. And so he, he put these borders and boundaries, and that's what those borders are for. But what they're not for, they were never to lock Israel down and prevent Israel from being a light to the whole world. As a matter of fact, just the opposite is true. God always wanted Israel to shine. They were the apple of his eye. And he wanted the whole world to see them. He didn't set them apart to make them special and only bless them. He set them apart to give them his special communion and his special power so that he could show the whole world, this is what I want to do for you. That's why on the New 
the gates of the new Jerusalem. The Bible says that upon those gates are the tribes of Israel. Their names are upon the gates of the new Jerusalem. The names are not on the foundation. The foundation has the names of the apostles. And the Bible said we are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. But the tribes of Israel's names were upon the gates of the new Jerusalem because they were the entryway for the whole world world every nation under heaven was going to find their way to God through these people Israel God was going to give them a law and that law was going to be a schoolmaster that would lead the whole world to Christ God, what he said to Abraham was he said I'm not just going to bless you and your family but I'm going to through you I'm going to bless all the families of the earth and God would even take Israel and put them in proximity to the heathen, even if in the form of captivity. He would put them in proximity to, to the heathen so that the heathen could see the glory of God. This is why it was said of Daniel in, in Persia. It was said, in him is an excellent spirit. And he is preferred above the presidents and the princes. He's a dissolver of doubt. Hallelujah. He understands hard sentences. This is why the Egyptian magicians could not turn the dust into lice. And they looked at Pharaoh and said, this is a different kind of act. We did the other things, but we don't know how they turned the dust into lice. This, they said, is the finger of God. That's why God wanted Moses performing miracles in Pharaoh's courtroom. He wasn't just showing off. He was trying to let Pharaoh know, I am your God. This is why he let Nebuchadnezzar peer down into the fiery furnace and say, didn't we throw three in the fire? Why then do I see four? Who is that fourth man? Why does he look like the son of God? This is why the Hebrew children would eat a different diet than everybody else. And everybody would look at their faces and say, they're different. They act different. They live different. Their brains are sharp. Something's different about them. God wants the world to know. Don't mistake his borders, which are very important, as preventatives to his people taking his truth into all the world. There are some tribes that are gonna be called to the borderlands. There are some among us who are gonna feel a call of God to go into borderlands. And these borderlands, I, I'll be honest with you, they make, they make us nervous. They're really close to Moab. They're really close to Ammon. These borderlands are really close to Edom. I mean, they're right sometimes up against the border. And it doesn't always make sense why they even felt compelled to go. And I will tell you this before I go a step further. I want you to know that there are some among us that God is going to open a door for you to walk into some borderlands. And you had better take it very seriously because it's not just destiny. It's also dangerous. I know you feel the destiny. You feel the destiny tugging at you. But it's not just destiny. It's also very dangerous. And I want to, by the help of God, I want to give you just a few things that I believe will help us successfully step into the borderlands on the other side of the Jordan. This thing was not done in a corner. This thing was noised abroad. Devout Jews out of every nation under heaven gathered around looking into what was going on in Acts chapter 2. It was always the will and the word of God to fill the whole earth with his glory. Yeah. Hallelujah. The first thing that I want to tell you about going into the borderlands that is of utmost importance and you, you must never forget it. It must always be about the harvest. 
Moses said, I don't like this, I don't like this. Brother Woodward, he wasn't comfortable with it. He said, I don't like this, I've seen this before. I've seen people who, who, who were just afraid to fight, they were afraid to commit, they were afraid to consecrate, I've seen this before. And Reuben, Gad, and they, they were able to look at him and, and, and listen, when your spirit is pure, you don't have to be offended. Moses is the man of God. What are, you, what, are you, what are you gonna do when Moses gets up in your grill and says, I don't trust you? Moses! Reuben, Gad, Reuben and Gad said, we understand. But, but if we could just share with you what we're feeling. We feel like we have to be there for the purpose of harvest. And if you're gonna go into the borderlands, it can only be for the purpose of harvest. You're not there to get rich. You're not there to get famous. You're not there to get famous and you're not there to get rich. And you're not there to get autographs and you're not there to get your picture taken with people who are lost. And they need a prophet, not an entertainer. That little girl in Naaman's house, as she stood there in Naaman's house, that little girl, God put that little girl in Naaman's house. There she was in the borderlands. There she was outside of Israel. There she was beyond the borders in Syria, just trying to do her job. God allowed her to be there because she's a light shining in the darkness. And Naaman, Naaman is about to die. Naaman is so frustrated and she says, there is a prophet in Israel. Let it be said that there is a prophet among us. Do you know that when Naaman came to the prophet Elisha, the captain of the host of Syria, this war commander, this prominent man of Syria, do you know that when he came to the prophet Elisha, Elisha didn't even meet with him. He sent Gehazi, and Naaman was offended. I fear that if Naaman would have been sent to us, here, before we pray for your healing, could we get a selfie? Could, could it get your autograph? Would you mind signing my, no, you, you, it's got to be about the harvest. Everything we do has to be about sowing and reaping and feeding the flocks. Sowing and reaping and feeding the flocks. Sowing and reaping and feeding the flocks. We're there as a light. We're there as a vessel of God. We're there as an ambassador for Christ. We're not there to compromise. We're not there to be accepted. We're not there to be loved and adored by all our fans. We're there to bring Jesus to the world. Oh, God, God, help us to be blessed in the borderlands. We've got to go to the borderlands. We can't lock this up and into our conferences. I love what we feel here right now. Thank you, Pastor Myers, Pastor Elms, all of our steering committee, all of our, all of our, everybody that's here, thank you. And, and thank God for the wind that's blowing through this house. Our desire is for it not to just blow in this house, but to blow out of this house and into the streets and into our cities. Hallelujah, and into our neighborhood. Let the wind blow where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof. But canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. We've got to go to the borderlands. But when we do, we've got to be wise as serpents, harmless as doves. When we do, we have to go humble and bold. When we do, we have to be we have to be fearless and we have to fear God. We have to go into the borderlands, ladies and gentlemen. And the first thing it has to, we have to understand is it's all about the harvest. Second thing we have to understand is that we cannot stop fighting the battles of Israel. We have to stay connected to one another and fight battles together. 
Reuben and Gad, don't you get off into those borderlands and think you don't need us anymore. You will lose your kids if you get off into those borderlands and you start rubbing shoulders with the Moabites and you start attending parties with the Ammonites and, and now you got Uncle Edom and they don't even know who Joshua is. No, no, you've got to keep fighting. You've got to stay in the trenches with your brothers. We've got to fight the good fight of faith. We've got to earnestly contend for the faith. Let me tell you something. This isn't the time to turn your back on truth. This is the truth that saves. This gospel of Jesus Christ is unto salvation. It is the power of God unto salvation. To everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, that's in the borders, but also to the Greek, that's beyond the borders. We cannot be ashamed of that. If it was ever a time to be a holy people, it's right now. My goodness, the whole world, the whole world's lost their mind. They don't, they don't know what a man is. They don't know what a woman is. They don't know what a male is. They don't know what a female is. Now is not the time for the church to say, it doesn't matter if you dress like a man or like a woman. Now's not the time to compromise holiness. Now's not the time to stop preaching the oneness of God. Now's not the time. It was never the time. But now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. It's time to let God fill us with the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah to overflowing. Now is the time for us to let him set us apart for his glory. Now is the time for us to reach the lost. Now is the time for us to pray and fast. Now is the time for us to cast out devils. Now is the time to lay hands on the sick and see them recover. Hallelujah. No, keep fighting these battles of Israel. You, don't get over there, Gad, and forget who you are. Number one, it's got to always be about the harvest. Secondly, we must always contend for the faith earnestly, fighting the battles of Israel. Third, we've got to let, listen, listen, we have to let Moses get angry with us. Even when our motive is pure even when he has incorrectly assessed our motive. Moses, Moses gets the right to be angry with us. Yes, he does. He gets the right. He's, he's a man of God. And he has the right to try our spirit without us getting mad and defensive. You let the elders confront you. I need, listen. If your spirit is right, it will be proven. If your spirit is pure, it will be proven. But that elder has a responsibility to try the spirits, whether they be of God. And you've got to let the elders, you've got to let them suspect you. You've got to let them be suspicious about what you're doing. You've got to let them wonder if you're telling the truth. And you cannot get defensive over it. When the princes of Israel call you into the room and demand an answer of you, be humble. And let your spirit be pure. And understand that these are my brothers, these are my elders, and they have a right to challenge me. And if I'm pure, I'll pass the test. I'm going to examine me. <laughs> examine that altar. Do we need to tear it down? Should we break it up and burn you? Whatever. You examine my spirit. I want to be right with God. Who do we think we are that nobody gets to confront us? This isn't our truth. This isn't our heritage. This isn't our church. This isn't our people. No, this is God's church and God's truth and God's heritage and God's people. And if we are wise stewards of it, then we will submit to elders who have genuine questions. 
got to be okay with them narrowing their eyes and saying, I, I have a problem with what you're doing. That ought to be an alarm to you. Then, then tell me what, tell me. Speak to me, talk to me, help me. I don't want to get over to those borderlands and forget who I am and forget who God is. Listen, you know what the Bible says? The Bible says, let the elders weep. And to young ministers, let me say this. Let the elders weep. Let them weep. It's their job to weep between the porch and the altar. Do you know how important that altar is? Do you know how sacred that altar is? Do you know what happens on that altar typifies the Lord Jesus Christ? It's not about your personality and whether you're accepted. Is it? No, no, it doesn't have anything to do with you or me. It has to do with, with the pattern and the plan and the promises of God. And when you walk from the porch to the altar, young priests and prophets and preachers and psalmists, you need to pass by weeping elders every time you come to that altar. Don't get offended by it. You know what, elders? You have, you have liberty to speak into this generation. Talk to us. Tell us what concerns you. We're listening. We're listening. God, forgive us for getting an attitude. God, forgive us for being arrogant, thinking we know it all. God, forgive us for thinking nobody has a right to challenge us or confront us or question our motives. Yes, they do. They are fathers. They are teachers. Yes, they do. They are elders and the Bible says let them weep let them have a problem with the way you do it let, let, their, let their view of it hone you and help you Moses wasn't exactly right he wasn't exactly right but Reuben and Gad humbled themselves and they were able and you know what he corrected them because they were willing to go to the borderlands without fighting battles. They were going. If Moses said, yeah, sure, go ahead. All right, love you. Hope you guys win those battles, by the way. We'll see you later. But Moses said, no, 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 no. We need all hands on deck. We need your shoulder to the plow. We need you to help us fight these battles. The elders' correction of you. Yeah, you're going to step into the promises of God that he has in store for you. You're going to be able to fulfill your calling. But the elders will prevent you from the pitfalls that await you. We have to sharpen one another. We have to be willing to allow each other to be that iron that sharpens iron. We have to be willing to speak and hear spoken words. Hallelujah. Words of correction and rebuke. Words of exhortation. Why? Because we're going to the borderland. And I can't go there just any old way. I've got to have it always about the harvest. I've got to have, I've got to always fight the battles of Israel. And I have to let my elders weep and challenge me and confront me. And I'll tell you what else we need to do. We need to build memorials for our children. Not to replace the real thing, but we've got to put the love of the truth in our children's hearts. Because we're going to the borderlands, folks. And we're going to be rubbing shoulders with people who don't believe like us. And we've got to put the love of the truth in our children's hearts. We want our children to know there is one God. And he's a holy God. And his people are holy. And he fills us with a holy spirit. Hallelujah. We want them to know what it means to pray. We don't want them to know what it means to be drunk at a nightclub. We want them to know what it means to be drunk in the Holy Ghost. We, we, don't want them, we don't want them to be strung out and sorrowful like this world is strung out and sorrowful. We want them to walk in the victory that God has destined them to walk in. Don't you take your kids into the borderlands and let them forget about the God of Israel. You better paint it upon the doorposts of your home. You better put those scriptures all over your house. You better wear it around your arm and put it as frontlets between your eyes. You better talk about it when you're sitting down in the living room. You better talk about it when you go to bed and wake up in the morning. 
Hear, O Israel. Hear, O Israel. Hear, O Israel. I don't care if you're an exile in Babylon. Hear, O Israel. It doesn't matter if you're a captive in Egypt. Hear, O Israel. It doesn't matter if Persia is dominating you. Hear, O Israel. The Lord our God is one Lord. Hallelujah. Your heritage is too rich to lose your children. Your forefathers paid too dear of a price, and it's a price you need to pay as well. You need to put blood and sweat and tears into preaching the gospel, into reaching the lost, and put a love of the truth into the heart of your children because God's taken us into the borderlands. Hallelujah. And we're going to get confronted on it. That's what they did with Peter. When Peter went to the house of Cornelius, they weren't patting him on the back. They weren't writing him thank you notes for that wonderful word you preached at Cornelius' house. No, no, no. They, they said, get in here, man. We got an issue with what you're doing. Who do you think you are? trying to go across the Jordan, trying to go out into the borderlands, trying to go beyond these boundaries and beyond these parameters. Who do you think you are? And Peter said, listen, guys, I know where you're coming from. Notice, Peter was like Reuben and Gad. He didn't get mad. He didn't pound his fist on the table. He didn't say, who do you think you are telling me what I can and can't do? Very humbly, he said, I, I know what you're thinking, but I'm telling you, God spoke to me. And I had to obey the voice of God. And they blessed it. When Paul came in with this big idea to take the gospel to the Gentiles, they said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Weren't you the guy killing us not too long ago? We want to we examine you and we want to check you out. Paul could have said, are you, who, what, are you serious? Do you understand how many epistles I'm about to write? How much work for God I'm about to do. This vision is bigger than anything we've ever seen or done or heard of. And you have the audacity to call me into a district boardroom and ask me questions. It's not what he said. That's not what he said. And that wasn't his attitude. And that can't be our attitude. We have to have clean hands and a pure heart. And we have to submit and be accountable to elders who watch for our souls. And we have to explain, this is what I feel the Lord has given me. And Paul explained it and the Holy Ghost began to move. And they began to say, okay, then go on out and extend the right hand of fellowship and preach this gospel. And Paul went into the borderlands. He was passing through the coasts of Ephesus. Hallelujah. Right on the border, right on the coastline of Ephesus and finds certain disciples. I'm telling you, folks, you get out in those borderlands and you're going to find people who are hungry for God. You get out on those coastlines. You get out in those borderlands and you're going to find people who are hungry for God and have had experiences where God was trying to lead them into what we have. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. No, you know what? I don't think we, I, I, I'm done complaining about how lost the world is. The world is lost. And, and guess what Jesus said about it? He didn't go and cry and get mad and, 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 and tweet against the world. No, he, he said, I came to seek them and I came to save them. Hallelujah. That's what I came to do. And that's what we're here to do. Guess what? Disney has gone off the rails. I say, I want to see a Holy Ghost revival at Disney World. But here's the thing, we don't need saints of God going up into Disney and all of a sudden you become woke. You need to go in there full of the Holy Ghost, full of wisdom, full of the power of God. We need to see a revival at Disney World. We need to see a revival in the NFL. We need to see a revival in the NBA. We need to see a revival in the Democrat Party. We need to see a revival in the Republican Party. We need to see a revival on Wall Street. We need to see a revival at Skid Row. We need to see a revival. Come on, I'm preaching to some borderland apostles. The Holy Ghost is upon you.
you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the earth. If you believe it, give God praise. Lift your hands all across this house. Could you lift your hands? Hallelujah. 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 This one God message is the greatest thing that's ever been told on this earth that God would become a man and manifest himself in flesh and remove the penalty of sin that we invited upon ourselves but can't get free from, but we've got to do it or it can't be done. So he became like us to do it on our behalf. That's amazing grace. How sweet the sound. Now's not the time to turn our backs on that message or let some kind of religious peer pressure come in and make us change how we believe no. You need to be more committed to it than you've ever been committed before because God's putting it in your heart right now to take into the borderlands. We're not afraid of talking in tongues. We're not ashamed of speaking in tongues. We're not ashamed of dancing in the Holy Ghost. We're not ashamed of worshiping God. We're not ashamed of being who we are. It's time to take who we are into the borderlands. Come on, I want somebody who knows God is calling you. In the areas where they're not going to agree with everything you say. We're so blessed and you've been so kind as I preach tonight. There's been a resounding affirmation of the word. But God's taking us into some places where they would just as easily arrest me for saying the things I've said than to say amen. And you've got to be willing to let God form you and shape you and mold you into a person who will bring the blessing of the Lord into the borderlands of this world. If that's you, I want you to come right now in the name of Jesus. I want some folks that feel called of God to step into the coastlines and the borderlands. You're gonna rub shoulders with Moabites and Ammonites and Edomites. You're gonna be right on the border. Sometimes your motives will be questioned. Sometimes the way you do things will be questioned and you've gotta be willing to be humble and be accountable. Be humble and be accountable. Be humble and be accountable. <laughs> Come on, young people, that's it. Don't you be overcome with evil. You overcome evil with good. Don't you be overcome with evil. You overcome evil with good. Come on, young people. God's putting an anointing on you. That'll call fire from heaven. That'll call water from a rock. God's putting an anointing on you of an excellent spirit. Jesus, in the name of Jesus. 
Dear Lord.